So welcome to our afternoon and closing panel. Uh, we're really excited to hear from this stellar group of friends um, sitting next to me. You know, as we plan these events, what we know is most important, of course, is hearing from the folks on the ground. And so we carve out the majority of our time to really dig in deep with the folks that are doing the organizing work. But we also know that as funders, um, as folks trying to navigate the philanthropic space, uh, it's sometimes good to hear from your colleagues because you all have different vantage points. You're all trying to move different strategies. You sit in different positions. You have a different ability to move something within your institution. So what we've heard in our evaluations is helpful is to actually hear from other uh, colleagues in the field that have grappled with some of the same issues that maybe you're grappling with today, that are wanting to fund folks to win um, and trying to figure out how to get there. And so this afternoon session, uh, we're creating that space to hear from folks that are um, in this work and um, their stories about how they're working through some of the things that you all are working through. So does that sound good? Great. So I threw them a curveball because, hey, what's not a closing panel, but if you don't shake it up and do something different than what you put on the agenda? Uh, um, we, got, we got to keep the funders on their toes, too. Uh, so I'm going to introduce them briefly, but I'm actually going to ask them each to um, just give us a couple of more things about yourself that you feel is important to bring yourself into the space. And then in keeping with the spirit of kind of what has touched our hearts, what has stimulated us, and what's moving us to action, just to pick one of those and reflect on them from the day, and then we'll jump into our set questions. So with us today, we have Laura McCarker, who is the president of the Parent Family Fund. For a long time, I called her Miss President. She didn't really appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. and now I just embarrassed her even more. Um, <laughs> and we also have Katrina Mitchell, who is the director of Child Well of the Child Well-Being mo Moment at the United Way of Greater Atlanta. That was a mouthful. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, William Cordry, who's a program officer with the Racial Justice Program at Wellspring. And um, these folks um, are just, their resumes and what they bring to the table is really amazing. And so just feeling really grateful to have, to be in conversation with you all. So. Um, Laura, I'll just turn it over to you to maybe just talk a little bit more and, and what's sitting with you today. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and I guess we're asked to give a, a little bit of background and then what's resonant, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? So I've been, um, I've been at the Perrin Family Foundation um, for about six or seven years now. I come to the work um, as a former youth organizer. Um, I didn't grow up in Connecticut where I live. I grew up in Oakland, California, um, and came to Connecticut to go um, to school. And there's been so much conversation here about home and where home is and what home means that I feel um, obligated to say that um, when I'm here in this room. Uh, and um, I really, I, I guess the other thing that's important to me um, to say about my current role is that um, I intentionally um, transitioned into um, working in philanthropy after having worked for a decade with young people of color in New Haven and really being pushed by my um, organizing mentors to think about what the most significant um, role I could play as a white woman um, in uh, advancing social justice work. And a lot of that meant um, thinking about how I was leveraging kind of my access and privilege in a different way to support um, the movements that I'm committed to, particularly um, those that center the um, leadership of black folks and people of color. Um, so that's, that's really what prompted sort of my transition from doing work on the ground to work in, um, to work in philanthropy. I'll talk a little bit more about what that's looked like in the context of the parent um, family Foundation. And I think one of the things that's really been um, 
in addition to all the talk about home that's been resident for me is uh, actually just in the last um, panel, there was a lot of conversation about um, how we perceive or how we define what infrastructure means and what relationships look like in the context of infrastructure. And, and that's something that I've thought a lot about and hopefully we can talk about a little bit more later on this panel. So, um, so again, Katrina Mitchell, um, I come to this work having grown up in New York City, went to school in Boston, went back to New York to work at a family foundation, um, and then have come back to the South and come to back to Atlanta um, at United Way. Um, at Atlanta and the South is my home now. I'm raising my children here, and I think this work is very personal to me um, because I want a different world for my children. Um, I have... Um, to almost 10 year olds, double digits. They're moving into the double digits this summer. Um, but they are my little activist in training. And so uh, this is very special to me to be in this space. And what I'm sitting with is how we honor people in place um, and listening to the voices of the young people who shared how grown ups have to show up for young people. Um, and I'm that's very present with me right now because I think oftentimes we think we're showing up by bringing our bag of programs and services and ideas and values and we don't really show up. And so I'm struck by that as a reminder for how we need to really show up. All right, how y'all doing? Good afternoon. Uh, well, I'm Will and um, yeah, what brings me to this work, I am from the South. I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. I, yep, yep. Um, I've lived all over now, uh, but the, I've lived in Seattle. I've lived in Ohio, Boston. I'm, I'm now in New York. But the South has remained my political home. Um, I was going to share, and I'll share now, that um, I, I came up in Atlanta. Project South raised me. Highlander raised me. Southerners on New Ground raised me. And that's so important to like not only mention, but to also like uh, be very transparent about what it means to be accountable to movement and to Southern family and, and, and community. So I'm super happy to be here. I think the biggest reflection for me today is that um, everyone's been so honest. And it hasn't felt like a funder space, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Um, and everyone has been so honest, but I have to say in particular, like. Folks like Lone and Brother Hollis and Ashley, who just spoke truth to power uh, in a completely unfiltered, uncensored way, like moved me. So just super grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so we wanted to start. Laura, you've long understood the strategic importance of investing in youth-led social change. So will you share with us a little about your journey to move from focusing on youth development to a strategy that invests in youth organizing? Yeah. So I work for a family foundation. Um, it's uh, based in Connecticut. Uh, it started out 25 years ago, um, and it was, you know, started by a wealthy, affluent, um, a wealthy, affluent family um, that wanted to give back <laughs> um, and had a passion for young people. Um, and so they started their work doing um, what a lot of um, kind of smaller foundations often do. They supported a lot of um, community-based services, after-school programs that were supporting young people. Um, uh, there wasn't necessarily a clear kind of strategic direction for their work. A lot of it was locally based in one particular kind of county in Connecticut, which was connected to um, kind of where the family grew up and where the family was raised. Um, and actually, w one of the really significant shifts that occurred um, for the family is that one of the, the second generation, um, fit one of the kids, basically, of the family in his early 20s became um, really involved and was a founding member of an organization called Resource Generation, um, which works with um, young people of wealth that are thinking politically differently about how they can leverage their, their wealth. And he actually played a really critical role in pushing the parent family um, to think about its funding a little bit differently. Um, and so the foundation sort of started playing around with that idea of thinking about, well, what does it mean to support youth voice and um, trying on some funding around some of that. Um, and I came on board at the foundation um, in 2012 at a time when PFF had decided that actually it wanted to really kind of focus on youth-led social change. And I mentioned the work that the um, 
the board member who's the son did because he did a lot of the internal work of the family to push them to start thinking um, about this work, which is often really critical. Um, that said, I came on board to a foundation that said, we want to fund youth-led social change and had no <laughs> idea what that meant or a clear <laughs> picture or definition of what that mean. Or, or, or even, you know, to be honest, a really clear political analysis about why. To be honest, some of the why was because this is what our boys want to do and we want to keep our family intact and some of this being some of the giving process, right? So I want to be really honest about that because often in philanthropy, particularly family philanthropy, we kind of draw this line where it's like you don't actually really get to talk about the conversations that family families have and what the motivations are, but that was a real, that was a real piece of it, right? There were other layers on top of that as well, which is that the family felt like they'd been doing this work for, you know, at that point, 15, almost 20 years, and they, they really didn't feel like they had had a clear impact. Like, what are we really trying to accomplish with the resources that we're putting um, on, the, on the table? Um, and wanting to feel like with the, um, with the assets it had available. And we're a, a small foundation in the land of Connecticut. Um, uh, so to give a little bit of context, because I'm in the South and I feel like there's also a lot of misunderstanding about Connecticut, there's about $12 billion in philanthropic assets in the state of Connecticut, um, $1.4 billion um, in giving annually. The majority of those dollars, the vast majority of those dollars actually leave Connecticut Right, and at our attempt um, a few years ago to map how, how much money in Connecticut was actually going to support community organizing work, um, the largest number we could come up with was 2.5 million. Okay, so that's just to give a little bit of context about Connecticut. Um, we had 17 um, police-involved murders of of residents in the state of Connecticut over the past three years. We're consistently at the top of the charts when you talk about um, income disparities, racial disparities across every system, criminal justice, education, right? So there are deep kind of um, deep-rooted, right, political inequities in Connecticut that our philanthropic sector generally sort of turns a, a, a blind eye to, right? So as a family, I think there began to be a willingness to say, if we want to have um, an impact, there's a way to continue our commitment, what has been a familiar commitment to thinking about impacting and supporting young people, and actually also begin to address kind of the root causes of the, of the um, landscapes and the issues um, and the communities and the conditions that our young people are operating kind of in and around. Um, so it was, it was that desire to both think about um, how can we continue to support the development of young people, which is something that the f family had held dear. Um, think about what Eric referenced as sort of this triple bottom line investment, the ability to have an impact not just on the individual lives of young people, but the communities in which they're living and the, the socio-political realities um, uh, of the state that we're in. Um, and that it was an area because there had been such a dearth of philanthropic investment in that the new resources that we were bringing to the table to be able to support that could, could have a significant impact. Um, and so those were some of the things that really pushed the, the foundation to begin supporting youth-led social change. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to move to Will quickly. Will, you know, I was so excited. I mean, back from SWAP, Project South, yep. like... I was excited to have Will on this panel, not only because he is a national funder, but because of his connection to organizing in the South. Um, so, Will, you're in the racial justice program at Wellspring that doesn't specifically focus on youth organizing, but can you tell us why young people are important to an intersectional funding strategy? Yeah, so I, um, I've actually shared some of my um, kind of internal conflicts around quote unquote youth organizing with some of my colleagues at FCYO. Um, where I, uh, I've often avoided that terminology, I've often avoided that like framing because I thought of it as too limiting or too tokenizing. And I remember 16 years ago when I used to raise funds for Project South and for the youth council at Project South, um, I remember um, trying to pitch something that was about like developing young people to show up and, and lead uh, movements in the future, and they are the future. Like, it was just very tokenistic and patronizing, and it wasn't a real reflection. And so I've had my own challenges around the term youth organizing as youth organizing. Um, 
And I can also tell you that at Wellspring, the program that I'm in, was founded because of the killing of Mike Brown, who was a young person, who was a black male, who was killed at the hands of the police and left in the street for hours. Um, I can also tell you over the last five years since his death, as Ashley pointed out earlier, tons of movement infrastructure has been built because of the movement for black lives, because of BLM, because of Trayvon, because of countless other young bodies that have been left in the street um, at the hands of state violence. And I share that because nowhere in there was there a conversation around like, this is about youth-focused organizing or youth-focused work. It was about saving our lives. It was about fighting for justice. And young people are often the ones who are on the front lines of struggle of every movement that has ever been in this country. <laughs> from the 50s, the 60s, and on, from civil rights to immigration rights to every single movement, young people are the ones that put their bodies on the line. And so um, for us, it is not called out as such in the strategy, but who we are in community with, the groups that we fund. They look like the Highlander Center, their Project South, their Black Youth Project 100, their Urge. They're all the folks who are leading movement that are um, intergenerational and that have young people's bodies on the line. And um, that is the approach that we take. Thanks, Will. And Katrina, we were so inspired to hear you are working to develop a fund at the United Way that will specifically support youth organizing. Can you share a bit of your story to start something new and why young people are, are instrumental to your local vision? Yeah. So new is the word. New. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, people would ask why United Way? So I'll give the history. Um, uh, and this, our United Way here in Atlanta is one of the largest United Ways in the country. The reality is we raise, you know, $90 million every year in campaign dollars and give it to nonprofits. Um, a couple of years ago, our CEO and board and staff started to question, right? We put all this money into communities, but we haven't seen any of the outcomes dramatically change for any of the communities. We have a 13-county metro region that stretches from the city of Atlanta all the way to Butts County, which is much more rural county. Um, and we have funded nonprofits that have spanned the range from education to early childhood to health, homelessness, and everything in between. Um, and it started folks starting to think, like, what's the value? If that much money is going into communities and things are not really different, then something's not right about that picture. And so um, we went about the business. At the time, it was our CEO just saying, I really need to know more. Like, I need to understand more what's happening. And so um, it started with one staff person going about and going to figure out um, what's the data, what, what is this saying? And so what she did was work with a couple of data partners to develop this child well-being index. Um, it cuts across different issues because people don't live their lives just in education and they don't live their lives in health. And so these separate portfolios weren't really what how pe families live their lives. Um, and it kind of combined all of the data and metrics in our community um, to really be able to have a picture of what, what is the well-being of communities across our metro area, all the way down to the zip code and the census tract. Um, and that got us to basically being able to develop a, a regional score and a composite score that says um, across our region, um, which is 13 counties, we are had a 58.9 score, which is failing by all means, which says that the well-being of our children and families is awful. Um, so again, all that money we put out into the region, it did absolutely nothing if you looked at everything from education to um, uh, unemployment rates to poverty, et cetera. Um, it also said that, you know, our dollars alone were never going to solve it, right? That just never was going to be the case. Uh, we might be the big gorilla in the room. That's not going to happen. That's not the way this works. Um, and that there was a core root issue to what actually is happening, and it's not just programs and services. So that's a shift. So anybody has been around in different countries from different um, across this country in different states and even worldwide united way has been seen as a charitable giving organization right that gives to charities that has been the model this community chess model um, but more and more we are having to change and evolve 
to really meet the needs of families, communities in a different way. And so the index started to drive people to ask them different questions. You know, what is that work? What does it mean? If we can't do it by ourselves, what does that look like? And so part of that was then saying, okay, who are we talking to? So we can't just be talking to nonprofits. We actually can't just be talking to folks who provide direct services, but we need to be talking to residents, young people, and just the nature of child well-being means are we talking to children, <laughs> to young people at all? No, it was mostly adults. Um, and so when I started, um, you know, I come from working at United Way. I understand the system. I also worked at Andrews Family Fund and have been in this national space and understand all of these bigger, broader issues and work and realized there was more I could be doing with my passion, my power, and my purpose, and my seat. And so I got to United Way having a whole different perspective about what this work needed to look like. And so I had an advocacy task force, which was the way of saying, okay, if we're gonna do this work, what does it look like? What are we missing? And so we recognized we did not know, you know, we weren't talking to residents, we weren't talking to community folks, we were kind of just doing this inside. Um, and so that task force included folks like Tanika Atkins from Pro Georgia, included folks um, that were in different spaces that we would have never talked to, right? So what is the tool? What could we be doing? What is missing? Um, and so we, we spent a couple of months, we sat and talked through what it was. Tanika Mosley, who I think is in the room too, she was on the um, task force as well. And it got to the space where the group said, organizing is the tool. Like, we need to be investing in community organizing. We're going to do the systems change work. We can't just be funding programs and services. We can't just be doing it by ourselves. we got to work in partnership with others. Um, and we can't be the big gorilla in the room. It needs to be driven by families, driven by young people. Um, and so they gave some core recommendations that were very bold for a task force and a group of volunteers and everything. If you know anything about United Way, we also listened to volunteers. Um, so the reality is, is that, you know, while I could have said all those wonderful things in a report that I wrote in 24 hours, <laughs> um, having volunteers really speaks volumes to our leadership, right? And having folks who are committed to this work outside of our system. And so they had some core recommendations. One, United Way needs to invest in organizing. Two, young people are missing in this, in this space and that youth organizing is a tool for us to support organizations and really support the systems change work. Three, at the core of this, the systems change work we wanna do is a lot about the structural racism that has existed in this community, in the South, in the metro area. It's inequitable. When you look at across the metro region, zip code right now determines a child's destiny, which shall no longer be that way. When we looked at the map, all of those communities were communities of color. The reality is we needed to do something different. Um, and so, that took me on my journey um, to say, which we are still on, this is new for us, um, but I understood that I needed some colleagues who have already been there before, and so I tapped into folks like Eric and others to say, this is where we wanna go, this is what we need to do, and so um, in the next, uh, in our next fiscal year, we'll be doing some piloting and, and supporting some local organizing groups, but we also worked with, um, FCYO and Emergent Pathways to really do a landscape analysis. Who are the groups in Atlanta, in the metro region who are doing work and are under-resourced? Who are the organizations? What is the capacity and need? And how does United Way play a part in that? So this is new for us, but what I would say is that philanthropy is philanthropy. We all have our stuff, but we need to broaden our, our ideas about who funds this work and how do we support it? Because the reality is that the young people need it and I really could care less where I sit. I need to be figuring out how I move those resources to the young people that need it the most. And so I sit right now in this seat, but the reality is that I could be someplace else and I would still be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm excited that United Way has stepped into this, has leaned into it. I have amazing staff who's been on this journey and I think in the beginning people were like, it's not possible, like you just can't do this. You won't make that happen. And I said, watch me, right? <laughs> because this is personal. I want my children to grow up. They're growing up here and I want that to be different for them. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you can clap that. Um, Laura, so given the experience you've had, do you have any best practices for 
funding and building the capacity of local youth organizations? Old oh, best practices, that's such a funny I know, word. I know, ah. as soon as it came out of my mouth, I was like, that's a dumb word. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so one thing, a few things, right? One thing that I'll say is um, that, that the Parent Foundation has committed to, which um, I think has made a significant difference, is it's committed to hiring folks who have done the work on the ground as their staff at the foundation. And we're a small team, but all of us have done kind of work on the ground. And so that, from the start, kind of shifts, um, helps to shift, I think, some of the dynamic and some of what we bring to the work. When we started um, this work at PFF, we also partnered with the um, Funders Collaborative for Youth Organizing to do kind of a, a, a scan and an analysis. The, the, the goal of that was, was less, n not really, to identify groups that were doing this work because we knew that there were a lot of groups out there that sought to that hadn't, hadn't been resourced to, to do so. The, the goal of the scan was really to, to think about what some of the landscape obstacles and challenges were. Why weren't we seeing more of this work happening in Connecticut? And the bulk of that story was surprise, surprise about what philanthropy was or wasn't doing or how it was doing it. Um, and that includes, um, you know, claiming that you want um, uh, systems change or structural change work, but funding only program, programs or projects that operate in a, you know, a 12 month grant cycle, right? Um, so a lot of the work that, uh, a lot of the work that we did at the Parent Foundation coming out of that skin was actually developing um, kind of an initiative that sought to respond to the challenges, obstacles, and barriers that the, the folks we engaged with in the scan process identified. Um, and those were organizations that were and were not grantee partners. Those were organizations that were incorporated and were not incorporated. You know, those were um, folks who, uh, by and large, um, many of whom had never received kind of philanthropic support um, for their work. And so, uh, uh, obviously, this is almost too obvious to state, but it bears repeating because it's something that philanthropy often has a hard time getting its mind around. Um, we asked, we listened, and then we did what we were told. <laughs> um, and so um, I think that would be one thing um, to elevate. And, and what that meant is we provided multi-year general operating support. <laughs> Um, to a cohort of organizations um, over a multi-year period of time. The other thing is that the Parent Foundation is really committed to supporting the process of organizing. And so that means we don't have specific issue-focused kind of areas. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and it has allowed us to approach our work with the movement building lens because we're able to create um, spaces where groups that were doing work on food justice were in the same room as folks were doing work on immigrants' rights in the same room as folks were doing juvenile justice and, and educational justice work. And so not only did we see relationships build kind of across um, issue silos um, and geographically um, across the state of Connecticut, but we also saw sort of a, a movement building orientation and folks kind of intersectional analysis around issues, right? So the folks that were working on school to prison pipeline in, in the reference to school discipline, we're now making connections about, oh damn, and Aramark who supplies our, our lunches for school food is also, like the, 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 their top two contracts are schools and prisons, and what does that mean, and what does that look like, right? So you get a stronger movement actually um, because we weren't kind of funding and narrow um, issue silos. And then the other thing, you know, we did the capacity building, another like big philanthropic word, but, but, but um, <laughs> I know, but it was significant and it was important. And, and this is actually something I was thinking about a lot coming from the earlier session where there was this conversation both about A, organizations that are doing work outside the nonprofit um, C3 structure. You know, the majority at this point of the organizations that we support are not incorporated. We've had a tremendously difficult time um, uh, connecting them with fiscal sponsors. In our region, there aren't org the organizations that exist that do fiscal sponsorship work are white-led organizations that had, do not have or share the political or racial justice analysis of the groups that we support. Um, the community-based organizations that do share that analysis don't have the have never been invested in to have the administrative capacity in many cases to be able to. Um, in many cases to be able to, to uh, support like the back end financial piece. So um, those are real challenges that we've been dealing with and I think part of how we're trying to show up as a funder 
um, in that mix is actually not just doing the give us the money and get out of the way thing. Um, and really trying to think about how do we show up as a strategic partner um, with our grantee organizations to, to really tackle what are some of the systemic obstacles and barriers that they're facing and the connective tissue needed to support um, and sustain um, to support and sustain that work. Um, and part of that, connecting to, to some of what was named in the, the earlier session, is that when we brought this cohort of, of organizations together to engage in this kind of multi-year capacity building effort, you know, we, we made a real commitment that we weren't gonna ask organizations to actually do anything together other than be together. Right? We made a, a, an intentional choice to say like this, we want y'all to learn to, to be together in this work first and we're not gonna say that you know, there's some joint or shared project or, or outcome or single campaign or any of that stuff that kind of has to come um, out of your work because the investment is in building um, the relationships that are gonna sustain this, this work, right? And, and that's what happened. I mean, the, 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 we continue to, to um, we, we have long-term relationships with our grantee partners as well, but even when um, sort of this particular capacity initiative that we provided to organizations ended, um, uh, organizations continue to receive um, multi-year general operating support and they continue to meet independently on their own monthly, right, to be able to sustain the relationship work that they moved in. And out of that was actually born a new statewide um, coalition, the Black and Brown Student Union, the first ever kind of youth-led coalition happening um, in the state of Connecticut to advance um, racial justice and educational justice work in the state. So those are those were some of the decisions, I think that we, we made a lot of decisions to, that enabled us to um, create an environment that let organizations on the ground do what they do best, right? And that was really our role. How do we think about how we create the environment for that work to, to, to grow? Okay, thank you, Laura. Will, I would love you for you to share more lessons from both working in the South and funding strategies to intentionally support the work. So if folks in the room are thinking about funding in the South, like what should they think about? Yeah. Um, well, okay, so the first thing I would say is that uh, funders, <laughs> we have got to stop weaponizing words like capacity. <laughs> Sustainability <laughs> and scalability. Yep. And, and 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 groups all around the country they hear those words, but it's, it's something particular that happens in southern contexts and southern movement spaces, black led work, people of color led work, and grassroots work, where those words are used against movements and saying, well, I just don't think they can do it. I just don't think they have the capacity. They're yeah. saying that's some racist shit. <laughs> It's fucking racist, um, and it's limiting. And so that's one mandate I have to us. Um, uh, you know, I shared earlier that I came, I come out of movement spaces. I feel very accountable to movement spaces and movement uh, groups uh, and uh, coming out of the South. And I can tell you that my first job in philanthropy, I was leaving Atlanta, heading up to Seattle to work at the Marguerite Casey Foundation, which for all intents and purposes is one of the few foundations that actually got the importance, few national foundations that actually got the importance of investing in the South and were willing to put deep, real money in the South for 10 years and calling it movement building long before other foundations were talking about movement building. This is in 2001. Everybody's talking about it now, but nobody was talking about it in 2001. I'm going to tell you that right now. So they were one of the first to do it, but they were also very clear about wanting Southern leadership to lead the Southern portfolio, provided you were willing to move to Seattle, <laughs> <laughs> which I did. I did for my people. But um, <laughs> on my way out, I had, uh, I had a meeting with Steph Gilliud, who's the co-director of Project South. That's where I was working many years prior. And she had just reminded me of this a few weeks ago. She said, Will, you came to me and you said, what are the non-negotiables? Like, what are the things that I now in this funder, very privileged funder space, um, need to hold myself accountable to, to you? To you as Project South, to you as Southern Movement, to, 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 to movement um, across the region, to leadership across the region. And um, one, I had forgotten that, so it was, it was really kind of warming to hear that from, from someone I respect so much um, and, and a place that raised me. But then two, um, it reminded me just, just how committed I have been to 
uh, and how accountable I have been to Southern movement and uh, black-led, people of color-led work across the South. And I have worked now in three national foundations, uh, one in Seattle, two in New York. Um, I have been the one, particularly the ones in New York, I've been the one who is pushing, <laughs> who has been pushing on doing more in the South and putting more money in the South, um, who has been pushing around how we do it and to have real, uh, be in real relationship with, with leadership and with communities in the South. And everyone in this room knows this already, like, and, and I'll say it anyway, but we know that when national philanthropy does sometimes wake up and pay attention to us, it's because of a natural disaster or an election, you know, electoral opportunity. Uh, so they parachute in and they parachute out like a lot of nationals might do. And I said, let's not do that. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's actually invest in infrastructure and be in relationship with and understand that everything, as Eric said this morning, everything runs through the South. The most regressive policies in this country are tested here, as well as like the, the strongest possibility for fight back and for organization has, been, uh, has emerged from here. So that has been my approach to Southern organizing um, and investing in and supporting Southern movement. Um, and yeah, I just, I feel like there's a, I have a mandate and a responsibility to do it right. Thanks. And Katrina, so what have you learned in trying to create something new um, and being innovative as you go along? So one, it's hard work. <laughs> um, but I think also some of it also is um, honoring the people in place, right? So, you know, I have the opportunity um, to be the champion for this work here locally in Atlanta um, and across the region. And so I have to use my voice, right? And so, you know, I listen um, to Will, you know, talk about how he uses his voice on the national platform. Well, I have to do it on the local platform. So one of the lessons is, you know, I need, um, you know, that community, folks who have my back. I, I remember listening to the young people talk earlier about how people showed up, right? So my people showed up where I knew I needed to call on folks, call on Eric, you know, call on others to say, look, I want to figure out how to do this here. I know it's possible, so I need that support, right, from my philanthropic colleagues, right? And I know you can't see what it looks like, but you know what? You know, our ancestors couldn't see what my life was going to be like today, mm. right? And so... My reality is that I have to spend a lot of time educating our local philanthropic community, right, about what they can't see. So, and, and so that takes work. It's hard work. I have, you know, colleagues from Janelle Williams and Tamika Mosley, when I've asked them to show up, you know, Lee and others, I've needed them to show up and use their voices in different spaces where I can't use it. That's part of what mm -hmm. I've had to do on this mm -hmm. journey. Um, but the other part of it is, you know, really being able to set a different table. So one of the things that we did, and because I understand how United Way works, we had, uh, before I got there, had kind of created these um, funds, which allowed us to do the traditional work, right, because it's 100 plus organizations, so you're not gonna change that overnight, but also create some flexibility in the way we fund. So we have an innovation pool of dollars that allows me to seed work like this, right? And so um, the reality is creating those internal structures makes this more possible so that I can support um, groups that don't have three years of grant reports and don't do evaluation reports and it doesn't look like the report, like those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but understanding that system was part of the journey too, right? How do you navigate that and create space for that? Um, and then the third is to acknowledge what I don't know. You know, doing mm. the landscape analysis was important because I needed to give some credibility to the work. We had an informed breakfast. I invited Eric and others to come and help, and Emery from Project South, you know, to really have a conversation with our community about what this work could look like. Um, but it also means there's some things I, did, I don't know, right? And so being able to be open to that and set a different table um, and, and really being able to be open to that has been, you know, unique um, and important. And then the last thing is listening to the young people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think so often, you know, I'm constantly telling people about the power of just listening to our young people, so much so that we had a huge breakfast um, a couple of weeks ago. We had about 500 stakeholders in the room to hear kind of how we're doing. And we started out the breakfast with a video with young people talking, right? 
that's a shift. I mean, it may seem like nothing to this audience, but that was a big deal to put young people at the center of all this work. You know, we say it, but do we really mean it? Um, and so, you know, I'm constantly reminded that we have to bring their voices into the room. And a lot of the young people, we've had listening sessions with young adults who feel disconnected, yes, all these programs and services, but they want to do more. They want more. They need more. They need adults to show up differently. Um, and so that's other part of it is to remind myself and lean into that and push us to do more of it, right? Um, and so it has been tough work, but I think, you know, when I came back a year ago, nobody thought I'd get this far. So I'm going <laughs> to keep going. Do it. Do it. Um, I just love how kind of threaded through all of what you all are saying is a few things. One, just like listening to learn and lean in to the folks that are leading the work. That's a lot of L's. Um, and, and, you know, showing up both for folks on the ground, but how others show up for you and, and you know, your partners in the field to get your back. Um, so I just really hope that folks in this room take that as an invitation to both listen and learn from folks on the ground and then let that lead your strategy and then also show up for each other and continue these conversations. So we have a few minutes. Before I let them say a couple of, of words to close, I actually want to open it up for, we probably have a couple of minutes for one or two um, questions from the audience. So there's mics up, or if you have a loud voice, feel free to just like stand up and holler out. Do we have any questions? Elizabeth. To the, to the first question, um, I, I should say that, that it's a, uh, more than just bringing folks together across issue areas, it's part of our core, like a core value of our grant making process is that communities know what they need and that's part of the reason why we don't define issue areas. So they can bring that kind of like forward to the table and lead with what they're defining as important, whether that's work around um, police violence or whether that's you know work around um, their schools. Um, and then really, it, the context in which they came together was a, a multi-year um, initiative called Block, Building Leadership and Organizing Capacity. It was an intergenerational um, effort that brought teams of young people and adults together um, uh, over a three-month period and two retreats and monthly cohort meetings. We had um, seasoned organizers and um, folks that had background in doing youth work um, kind of leading this cohort really with the goal of helping to grow both the organizational and organizing strength um, of the groups around um, of the groups that were a part of the, the cohort, right? And it was combined kind of with grant making. So they were there together to kind of like learn, to strengthen their work, to strengthen their strategy, um, their, their kind of individual strategies. We had organizations that um, had budgets of less than $25,000 when they started the cohort, and five years later, you know, have budgets of $350,000, $400,000 because of some of the organizational strengthening work and the behind-the-scenes work that we were able to do. Um, so that, that was sort of the block initiative, and we actually have a report we can put out back that we, um, that we did recently kind of talking about um, our lessons learned from what made that, like, process um, work, not, not what the organizations did, but, but, but how we did and, you know, how we did in that process. But really, you know, part of what we learned, as I said a moment ago, is that we had to, um, there was a point in the initiative where, where we had to take a step back and say that, that the groups being together and manifesting their ownership of the space was actually the central work of the space, not whatever agenda we brought to it around what we were trying to get them to get out of it. Right, and so I think that that's probably one of the most um, significant like learnings, and, and why I make that distinction between kind of um, being together and doing together. Yeah, it's a great question. So you know, across the country, United Ways are having to think about a transformation. It's being driven for different reasons. One, we can't just be fundraisers, right? That 
that that model, the workplace looks different in the traditional way in which you do that work just is dramatically different. Um, and so that is calling on United Ways to, to think differently and think about what their new model of work is. Um, but we are one of the larger ones in the system. So I think what I think we've realized is people do look to us, mm -hmm. right? And so many of them are doing things in different ways, but we're charting a new territory. Um, we have had some United Ways in the South come to us, particularly because the Child Wellbeing Index made them take a look at their communities in a very different way. And so, you know, from Alabama to others, you know, and so we're still figuring that out. I think we're really early on that journey, um, but many of them have come to us for, you know, come to kind of see what we're doing and how we did that, both what the internal work had to happen to do that and what leadership you needed differently. Um, and so you do have some who are starting to, you know, from Charlotte to Baltimore who've been involved in some of these pieces of work because of the nature of what's happening in their community. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it depends, but I would say, you know, we're pretty on the far end of kind of the shift that <laughs> we're heading down. Um, but I do think that there's an opportunity um, for leadership at the United Way level to play an important role um, in this philanthropic space, which they haven't always played. And that looks very different. Um, but I think, you know, again, it's it's about where you use your seat. And so for me, this is where I sit and I, I it has to be different, right? We're gonna have to, or else they won't exist, you know, mm -hmm. so. One more question, does anybody have one more question? Go ahead. Sure. No GOTV, no ticket positions, <laughs> no, you know, what it really yeah. takes to yeah. change the system, right? So it's like, what are we really <laughs> talking about, right? So, um, yeah, so it is what it is. I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start and then I'll let them answer the rest of it. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things that we've explored, and we're still figuring this out, right? Like our task force said, we need to have a collaborative fund. What that looks like and what that governance structure stuff looks like, you know, we, we are still figuring it out. But I think one of the things that we realize is we probably need intermediaries, like for us, for United Way, right? So that, you know, where there we can identify local intermediaries that can help really move the resources to where it needs so it keeps our politics at arm's length from being able to do that work and you know that'll yet to be seen what that looks like but that's I think and probably going to be a really important strategy for us um, we, we can garner the resources but we need to, may need to grant them to intermediaries to really be able to do the work on the ground to give, keep some arm's length to allow that to happen and not interfere so mm -hmm. that's we'll clean your money <laughs> Whew, yeah, man, you uh, you touched on a whole nother <laughs> session workshop that we could be having around um, just the confinements of working inside of any type of industrial complex to undo that industrial <laughs> complex. Um, yeah, uh, so I will say that um, there uh, there are there are some of us. There are many of us who work in the confinements of foundations and nonprofits and all of these structures that we have to because that is the structure that that we um, are rocking with but we also have a politic and a vision far beyond it and that's true even in foundations like I can tell you that I know like my job is to come today every day and be subversive <laughs> to think about how to uh, use the master's tools as much as I can to at least crack that door open to the master's house. <laughs> Um, how I can push things that set us up for liberation, set people up for liberation. And I have to say, like, even inside of my institution, I think I'm fairly lucky, is that there are folks who think like that even higher up. Like, some of our leadership understand, like, and, you know, theoretically what we're moving towards, what liberation looks like, means that none of this exists, right? Like, you cannot really bring about liberation inside of a 501c3 infrastructure that limits your ability to do electoral power building and all these other things. You can find your intermediaries, you can do whatever, you can empower people, you can um, find a way to make it, to set up the conditions to advance liberation, um, given the confinements that we have. And so, 
um, yeah, I would say that. There are several of us who are committed to that work. And I would just really quickly add, I mean, yes, to the frustration of foundations expecting like C4 results without having C4 dollars to put on the table. I understand that. I think the other thing I'll just raise from you know the context of working at a you know a, a really small foundation um, where we don't have layers of bureaucracy that separate like the program staff from the grant management staff is that there's actually a lot that can be done internal to a foundation to open up just in the way that grant contracts are written, the way grant letters are written. Part of the reason why we provide general operating support is organizations can you know, sort of do what they want with it. So when we write our grant letters, we say um, this funding is not earmarked for lobbying, but nowhere in our grant letters does it say this money cannot be used for lobbying, right? So just for other like philanthropic colleagues in the, you know, in the room that when you're providing general operating, so there are a lot of things sort of that, that um, restrictions that sometimes unnecessarily get placed in sort of the minutia of grant contracts that there can be, um, you know, and there's some folks out there in, you know, in philanthropic spaces that are doing some good work around so that you are actually um, passing on to your grantees the, the maximum um, amount of, of power and being able to leverage your grant dollars to, to generate the kind of changes that they're fighting for. And if I could just add, like, there's, so, there's, there's something about, the, like, supporting the development of politicized leadership, right? Like, so when I look at the work of folks like Highlander or Project South, or do folks in here know Bold, Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity? That shit is revolutionary. It's revolutionary what they are doing and what Denise Perry has been doing for years in developing cohorts of black movement leadership across like movement spaces, across issue areas in a way that foundations can digest and understand, um, but also in a way that gives distance from foundations so that black, emergent black leadership can do what they need to do to fight for liberation for their people. That is one approach to subversive investment for radical change in leadership. 